Welcome to the Literary Digest. Please subscribe to the channel or give a like and comment on this video if you find it helpful to help us reach more people. Have you ever wondered about the nature of reality or questioned the certainty of your own experiences? It's a fascinating inquiry, one that invites you to explore the boundaries of knowledge and perception. How can you be sure that the world around you is real and not just a construct of your mind? These are the kinds of questions that philosophers have pondered for centuries, and now you have the chance to reflect on them too. But this exploration isn't just an abstract exercise, it's about gaining deeper insight into your existence. In this summary, you'll encounter some of the most intriguing philosophical questions. Whether it's considering the nature of reality, the existence of other minds, or the idea of free will, these topics will challenge your everyday assumptions. Engaging with these ideas can sharpen your critical thinking, broaden your philosophical perspective, and provide a richer appreciation of life. This experience offers an opportunity to deepen your intellectual curiosity and enrich your understanding of the world around you. Ready to discover the inner workings of life, the universe, and everything? Then, let's dive in. Chapter 1. Is everything just a product of your mind? Let's start off by pondering a fascinating question, how can you be certain of anything beyond your own thoughts and experiences? This profound inquiry has intrigued thinkers for generations. When you examine it closely, the only absolute truth you can grasp is the existence of your mind and its contents. Everything else, your surroundings, other individuals, even your physical form, could potentially be an illusion or a creation of your imagination. This concept might seem outlandish initially, but it's more plausible than you might think. Your entire perception of reality is processed through your senses and interpreted by your brain. You've never experienced the external world directly, only your mind's interpretation of it. So how can you be confident that what you perceive truly exists outside your consciousness? Consider this scenario, what if your entire life up to now has been an intricate dream or simulation? How would you discern the difference? You might attempt to prove the reality of the external world by touching objects around you or seeking confirmation from others about your experiences. But even those sensations and interactions would merely be additional contents of your mind. After all, there's no way to transcend your own consciousness to verify anything beyond it. This line of reasoning leads to a philosophical stance called solipsism, the notion that only your own mind is certain to exist. While few embrace this belief wholeheartedly, it remains a logical possibility that's challenging to conclusively disprove. A more moderate position is skepticism about the external world, which simply asserts that you can't be absolutely sure that anything exists outside your mind. Naturally, most people don't question the reality of their surroundings constantly. We possess a strong, innate belief in the external world that's difficult to dismiss. From a practical standpoint, it makes sense to behave as if the world is real, even if we can't prove it philosophically. But reflecting on these questions occasionally can be valuable. They encourage us to approach our beliefs with humility and remain receptive to fresh perspectives. The next time you engage with your surroundings, pause to appreciate the enigma of existence. Reflect on the possibility that your entire reality could be a creation of your mind. While absolute certainty may elude you, contemplating these ideas can spark profound insights about consciousness and existence. It's a mental exercise that can broaden your philosophical horizons and deepen your appreciation for the marvel of lived experience whether that experience reflects an objective reality or not. Chapter 2. The Enigma of Other Minds Let's move on to the minds of others. How do they work compared to your own? This intriguing question has captivated thinkers for ages. While you interact with others daily, observing their actions and hearing their words, can you ever truly grasp their internal experiences? This philosophical riddle opens up a Pandora's box of inquiries about awareness, perception, and the very fabric of reality. Consider a simple scenario, savoring chocolate ice cream with a friend. You might suppose you're sharing an identical experience. 
But can you really be certain? What you label as chocolate could be entirely different for your friend. Perhaps your perception of chocolate aligns with their sense of vanilla, or even a flavor beyond your imagination. There's no direct method to compare these internal sensations. This uncertainty stretches far beyond the wonderful taste of ice cream. Take colors, for example, the vivid red you perceive when gazing at a fire engine might register as what you'd term yellow to another person. They'd still use red to describe it, as that's the word they've associated with that visual input. Yet their inner perception could be fundamentally unlike yours. You might contend that human biological similarities necessitate comparable experiences. But this belief stems solely from personal observations. A skeptical philosopher would highlight that you've only directly experienced the link between your own sensory inputs and conscious perceptions. Applying this to others requires a leap of faith rather than certainty. If you extend this thinking to its most extreme, you'll encounter a troubling notion, what if other people don't actually experience consciousness? It's conceivable that everyone around you could be like highly sophisticated robots. These human robots might behave as though they have feelings, thoughts, and experiences, yet they could be devoid of any true inner life. This idea likely feels intuitively wrong at first. Your immediate reaction is probably to believe that other people have consciousness, just like you. But here's the challenging part, can you really prove it? Is there a definitive way to know for certain that others possess an inner world similar to your own? This isn't to suggest that you should start questioning whether people are conscious. Instead, it underscores the profound enigma of other minds. It encourages approaching others with humility and inquisitiveness, acknowledging that their internal landscape may differ from yours more dramatically than you can fathom. Next time you engage with someone, pause to marvel at the unseen depths of consciousness you're interacting with even if you can never fully access or comprehend them. Chapter 3. Do we really have free will? Picture yourself at a dessert counter, facing a tantalizing choice between a decadent chocolate cake and a sun-ripened peach. This everyday scenario actually touches on one of the most intriguing questions in philosophy. Do we truly possess free will? Let's explore this captivating debate and consider what it means for your daily decisions and your life's trajectory. The essence of the free will question asks whether you genuinely have the ability to choose between options, or if your actions are predetermined by factors outside your control. When you reach for that chocolate cake, are you making an autonomous choice, or was that decision inevitable based on your life experiences, genetic blueprint, and the precise state of your brain at that instant? The concept of determinism proposes that every occurrence, including your choices, is the inescapable result of prior causes. If this holds true, it would suggest that your dessert selection was preordained by the entire sequence of events leading to that moment. This perspective might seem to strip away your sense of agency after all, how can you be truly accountable for a choice that was, in essence, orchestrated by the cosmos? But here's where the plot thickens. Even if determinism is false, and there's an element of chance in how events unfold, does that actually grant you free will? If your choice between cake and peach was somehow arbitrary, rather than predetermined, would that really constitute a free choice for which you're responsible? This conundrum strikes at the core of our understanding of personal accountability, ethics, and the very nature of human action. If all your choices are predetermined or random, how can you be genuinely praiseworthy for virtuous acts or culpable for misdeeds? This question carries profound implications for how we approach everything from the justice system to personal development. Yet, despite these philosophical quandaries, you likely experience a strong intuitive sense that you do make authentic choices. When you resist temptation or motivate yourself to achieve a goal, it feels like you're exercising free will. This disconnect between your lived experience and the philosophical arguments is part of what makes this topic so engrossing and crucial to ponder. The next time you face a decision significant or trivial, pause to reflect on what's truly occurring. Are you exercising free will, or are you merely enacting a predetermined script? 
By engaging with these questions, you can cultivate a deeper understanding of yourself and the nature of human action. While the free will debate may never fully be resolved, exploring it can yield valuable insights about personal responsibility, the nature of consciousness, and what it genuinely means to be human. Chapter 4 The Deeper Roots of Right and Wrong Imagine you're working the late shift at your local library. The building is quiet, the shelves cast long shadows, and you're about to close up when a close friend approaches with an unusual request, they want you to help them smuggle out a rare book without checking it out properly. This seemingly simple scenario opens up a quandary of ethical dilemmas that have puzzled philosophers for millennia. The essence of right and wrong goes beyond mere obedience to laws. It's easy to label theft as wrong, but morality has deeper roots. In this sense, assisting your friend might cause a twinge of unease, stemming from your innate sense of fairness and consideration for others. Perhaps you take a moment to think about the wider impact of your choices. Allowing the book to be taken could deprive other patrons of a valuable resource and betray the trust your employer has in you. These actions extend their effects far beyond your immediate circle, potentially impacting lives you may never directly encounter. But what if your friend dismisses your concerns for others? This is where ethical exploration becomes truly fascinating. The age-old query, how would you feel if someone did that to you? Isn't just clever wordplay, it's an invitation to step into another's shoes and view the situation from fresh angles. This act of empathy is vital. When you cast yourself as the victim, you're likely to experience indignation, frustration, and a belief that the thief should have weighed your feelings. By acknowledging these emotions, you're recognizing that people have cause to value each other's well-being, even as strangers. Here's the crux. If you believe others ought to consider your feelings and interests, logic compels you to offer the same consideration to them. This give-and-take forms the foundation of ethical conduct. It's not about blind adherence to rules, but about recognizing common humanity and the reverberations of your actions. Balancing your own interests with those of others is complex. Achieving perfect selflessness is rare and it's debatable whether it's even desirable. But grappling with these concepts helps you develop a deeper understanding of ethics and make more considered choices in everyday life. Chapter 5. Is Death an End or a Transition? Ah, death is a subject everyone has to face, yet it remains one of the most profound and puzzling philosophical questions. Take a moment to consider your own mortality you might feel a mix of inquisitiveness, unease, and perhaps trepidation. With those feelings in mind, let's now explore a few different viewpoints on death. In doing so, you'll be able to gain clarity and insight into this shared human experience. Let's start by considering the idea that death might simply be the end of existence a total cessation of consciousness and self. While this notion may seem unsettling initially, it's worth examining more deeply. You could worry that you're unable to truly imagine your own non-existence. After all, how can you conceive of not being when you need to be to do the conceiving? But this is something of a mental illusion. You can, in fact, envision your non-existence from an outside perspective, similar to picturing yourself in a deep, dreamless sleep or unconscious state. This brings up intriguing questions about the nature of awareness and identity. If your mind is fundamentally connected to your physical brain, as many thinkers and researchers believe, then the end of brain function at death would indeed mean the end of your subjective experience. Conversely, if some form of mind-body separation is true, and your consciousness exists independently from your physical form, then various types of afterlife become conceptually feasible. Let's put aside the question of what occurs after death for a moment. How might you feel about your own finite existence? Should death be feared, welcomed, or regarded with neutrality? There's no one-size-fits-all answer, but examining your own values can guide you. If you think that non-existence is neither positive nor negative, but simply neutral, then perhaps death itself isn't something to fear. Or you might see death as depriving you of future positive experiences, making it a negative event. 
You could also view death as ultimately liberating you from life's challenges and monotony. As you ponder these weighty topics, keep in mind that thinking about death can actually deepen your appreciation for life. By confronting your mortality, you might find yourself living more purposefully and relishing each moment more fully. While the true nature of death will likely remain unknown during your lifetime, grappling with these philosophical questions can lead to significant personal growth and a richer understanding of what it means to be alive. Final Summary In this summary, to what does it all mean? By Thomas Nagel, you've learned that philosophical inquiries into the nature of reality, the existence of other minds, and the concept of free will challenge your everyday assumptions and understanding of existence. The discussions highlight the possibility that your perceptions could be illusions and that the external world might not exist outside your consciousness. The idea of solipsism suggests that only your own mind is certain to exist, while skepticism questions the certainty of anything beyond your mind. These reflections encourage a deeper appreciation of life's mysteries and foster intellectual curiosity, inviting you to think critically about the world and your place in it. Ultimately, engaging with these philosophical concepts will enrich your understanding and perspective on life. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe to the Literary Digest for more videos like this one. And don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you found most helpful. Until next time, keep striving for success.